Good morning, members of Parliament. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, for our workshop towards a circular economy, a workshop for members of Parliament and parliamentary staff here at the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, thank you so very much for being here. I will now invite the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Bridget and Sir George to deliver opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mistress of Ceremonies, Ms. Jacob Motley, Senator the Honorable Christine Kangaloo, President of the Senate of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, Senator Anthony Vera, and Vice President of the Pal Americas Network for Climate Change for the Caribbean and today's moderator, members of parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Ms. Alicia Todd, Director General of Pal Americas, Ms. Vanessa Essinger, Circular Economy Specialist and Coordinator of the Circular Economy Coalition for Latin America and the Caribbean, Mr. David Oswald, Founder and President DE Design and Environmental and Environment, sorry, Inc., Fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society and Associate Faculty of the Royal Roads University. Dr. Sherwin Millet, Sustainability Consultant at the College of Science, Technology and Applied Arts of Trinidad and Tobago. Ms. Cyan Coffey Young, Waste Management Educator trainer and founder of CL Environmental Services Limited. Ms. Kiba Jacob Motley, the acting clerk of the Senate, procedural clerk of the Financial Scrutiny Unit, and of course, our mistress of ceremonies, staff of the Office of, the, of Paul Americas and the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this event, which aims to provide a greater understanding of the circular economy and of our role as parliamentarians in seeking to promote and support strategies for, tra for a transition towards a circular economy. Colleagues, we all know that in order to effectively discharge our budgetary, legislative, oversight, representative and advocacy rules. We are required to possess a working knowledge of all disciplines on of new and emerging technologies, processes, trends, schools of thoughts, threats and opportunities. In our local parlance, toot bagai. But I begin with an apology to our co-hosts and facilitative partners, Pal Americas our subject matter experts and presenters, and to you members for the couple of times that this event has been rescheduled. Be assured that the delay is no indicator of our, of our view of the ranking of the importance of this topic. I am convinced that the relevance of this topic increases daily. Upon reflecting on my message for today's event, I found myself asking the question, what will our middens say about us? The National Environment Policy of Trinidad and Tobago proclaims our vision for the environment as follows. We, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, aspire to make our country a place where we can enjoy a high quality of life within a safe and healthy environment where natural resources are safeguarded and used sustainability. We foresee a future where all stakeholders from citizens to political and non-political, formal and informal groups are actively involved in the management of their national and local environments based on strong environmental ethics. Will our middens demonstrate that we realized our vision? Or will our middens undeniably paint an image of environmental irresponsibility 
and of a production and consumption philosophy of take, make, consume, and dispose, which rests on a foundation of mass and indiscriminate extraction and harvest of raw materials and wanton waste. All too often, when we think of waste, our focus tends to be targeted on waste disposal. Undisputably, waste disposal is of critical importance as the science informs us that landfills are the third largest source of human caused methane emissions, which leak toxic leachate into our soil and water. And in many cases around the world, landfills are reaching or are at capacity. Our local story is no different. In the 2016 report of the State of the Marine Environment of Trinidad and Tobago, it was outlined that land-based pollution has a drastic impact on the marine environment, which included, but was not limited to hydrocarbons, nutrient pollution, and metal, heavy metals, excuse me. The Daily Express of June 20th, 2018 headline, the Beatum landfill is running out of space and further reported that, and I quote, we produce 700,000 tons of waste per year. The average person produces 1.4 kilograms of waste daily. And these are 2010 statistics, end quote. One of our GSEs, the Joint Select Committee on Finance and Legal Affairs, in a 2019 report, found that our country was producing too much garbage and should reduce the amount by half. The report generated a very damning headline in the Newsday of June 3rd, 2019. TNT drowning in waste. But waste disposal is at the exit point of the take, make, consume line. Understanding the differences between a linear and a circular economy, simply put, is that the former has no concern about waste in any sense of the word, while the latter is concerned about how we dispose of waste and if we are doing so sustainably. That is the right to repair, upcycling, and recycling. Our national waste recycling policy highlighted that there was clear evidence that a significant amount of recyclable materials were disposed in our four major landfills. Additionally, and more importantly, the circular economy promotes the incorporation of byproducts of any productive process into the production chain. It is about limiting waste generation. It is much more than recycling. It is about using and reusing raw materials and their byproducts until they are no longer of any productive use. And thereafter, the byproducts are recycled or dung cycled. The essence of the circular economy, I am sure will be outlined by our experts when they speak. And I admit, I am no subject matter expert. Although I have read, and listen to some degree about a circular economy. Yes, some of it is very scientific and technical, but my eureka moment came when I found an analogy in the food chain of the ecosystem in which nothing wastes. The circular economy is about sustainability. It is about innovation and the redesign of products and production methods towards more natural and closed loop processes. It must also be emphasized that a circular economy promotes long-term employment and job creation, and not only stimulates greener economic growth, but when implemented through an intersectional lens can promote gender equality by providing financial support to community projects and ventures for youth and women 
that promotes circularity. It benefits can also redound to the disproportionately impacted marginalized and rural communities who may lack social services such as adequate waste disposal or whose sources of income are directly tied to the health of the environment such as agriculture and coastline fisheries. In fact, the National Environmental Policy Priority 4 under the caption, Evolving a Greener Economy states, greening the economy is a means to strengthen the country's economic performance through the introduction of new value added economic activities, increase efficiency across all sectors, reduction of waste and the generation of green jobs. Towards that end, the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago shall encourage the growth and development of a circular economy in which waste is revalued and resources are circulated locally as much as possible. That is at page 35 of the policy. The circular economy therefore is about job creation. It is about bringing about a greener, healthier world. It is about climate change. In its most recent report, I believe it was released yesterday, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, laid out five ways to save the planet, among which was curbing demand in varied areas, included low carbon diets, food waste, how, how we build our, our cities, and how we shift people to more carbon-friendly transport options. The quest to make advances in sustainable production and consumption are being explored. There is a plethora of examples where the things that we so readily discard as waste are being used for environmental benefit with profitable outcomes. That is internationally, and we have our local examples to name a few. For instance, from Cause Recycling Depot, at which they recycle plastic bottles, aluminum cans, glass bottles, and Tetra Pak cartoons. We have paper recycling firms. And I was delighted to see that SwimCall's website provides a list of organizations that receive and process 22 items of recyclable waste, including carnival costumes and cooking oil. 50% of the energy produced by TGU is from the heat energy from the gas turbines exhaust, which, have, which would have otherwise been wasted to the atmosphere. Further, TGU themselves, although uh, uh, an energy generating company, they recycle paper, glass, wood, cardboard, plastic, scrap iron, fluorescent bulbs, batteries and EVs. And later this morning, we shall learn of some other examples being done in Trinidad and Tobago. As regards the sustainable development goals, Patrick Schrauder, in a 2018 study, the 17 sustainable development goals and the 169 targets in a comprehensive mapping exercise showed that the strongest relationships and synergies between circular economic practices and the SDGs targets lie within SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, SDG 12, responsible consumption and production, and SDG 15, life on land. It will be remiss of me if I fail to mention plastics. We all know the negative environmental impacts of flooding and on our fishing industry, but 
also on our personal health. In a UK Guardian article titled, Microplastics Found in Human Blood for the First Time, this article was March 24th, 2022. That study showed that in healthy adults, half the samples contain PET plastic, which is commonly used in drinking bottles, while a third contain polyesterine used for packaging food and other products. A quarter of the samples, and these are blood samples of healthy human beings, contain polyethylene from which plastic carrier bags are made. But there's hope for ingenuity and change. As the examples have indicated um, in, in the use of recycling, processes. And for us, we have a long time example that is almost a century old because we cannot forget that our national instrument, the steel pan, is a transformative invention of a waste product, which through the vehicle of culture and cross-cultural exchanges has not only just endured, endured the test of time, but has spread globally. As legislators, collaborators, and stakeholders, we are called upon to drive the necessary mechanisms that can foster the best results for our nation. As we look ahead towards a circular economy, I suggest to you that we should seek to, one, identify our ways and what elements we can control with the assistance of waste audits. Two, we promote zero waste programs and designs where we can. And three, become ambassadors and champions of the circular economy. In this way, we can also empower us, our citizens as agents of change in the transition towards circularity as we all work together to support a societal shift away from wasteful consumption and production patterns and towards the sustainable consumption and production practices recommended in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Right Honorable Alok Sharma MP and President for the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference, commonly known as COP26 in Glasgow, 2021 stated that the time is now as this is our chance to forge a cleaner, healthier, and more prosperous world. Let the conclusion from our middens be that we acted now and realize the vision of a cleaner, healthier, and more prosperous Trinidad and Tobago by employing the circular economy. I wish us all an enlightening and productive morning. I thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, okay, so participants, members, staff, we get an opportunity to take a photo, a group photo. So this is where you get to turn on your camera and smile so that we can document the exciting times we're about to have today. We're all good. Oh. I think we're good. Maria, you got it? Yes, I did. Okay, good. Thank you very, very much. Thank you members, thank you staff and other participants for that wonderful photo. Okay, so next down, I will introduce Senator Anthony Vera. Um, Senator Vera is an independent senator here at the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. He's also the Vice President for the Caribbean of the Pal Americas Parliamentary Network on Climate Change. 
And so, Senator Vera will serve as our moderator for today's session. So, Senator Vera, thank you very much. And welcome. Thank you, MC Jacob Motley. And good morning, colleagues. It's a pleasure to join you as the moderator for today's workshop. Madam Speaker spoke about the just issued IPCC report. Well, that report is warning about the need to avoid an extremely dangerous future. Even if all the policies to cut down carbon were fully implemented, the world is still going to warm by 3.2 degrees Celsius causing unprecedented heat waves, terrifying storms, and widespread water shortages. The next few years are critical because if emissions aren't curbed by 2030, the report warns that it will be nigh impossible to limit global warmer warming later this century. The situation is dire. The time is now now or never to limit warming. I like to say that waste is only waste if you waste it. And the parliament obviously has a central role in progressing circularity in Trinidad and Tobago. I am certain that today's workshop will help enrich our understanding of what that entails. And it will inspire us to seek opportunities to apply the circular economy model as we advance this topic from our institutional role as parliamentarians. I would like to begin by thanking the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Bridget Anizet George, for her leadership in bringing this workshop to our parliament and for offering the welcome remarks to inaugurate today's session. I also offer a warm welcome our panelists who will each provide a presentation to illustrate the applications of a circular economy model in regional and national contexts, drawing from their specific experiences and lessons learned, including recommendations as to how we as parliamentarians can inform and actively support a transition away from the linear towards the circular economic model. The presentations will be followed by an open dialogue where participants are invited to ask our panelists questions and to seek clarifications on their presentations in preparation for the interactive exercise where we will break into groups to deepen our understanding of the concept and brainstorm possible parliamentary actions to advance this agenda. Today's workshop will conclude with closing reflections from Madam President of the Senate, the Honorable Christine Kangaloo. Colleagues, I invite you to take advantage of this space created today to learn as much as we can from our panelists, but also from each other as innovation requires collaboration. And for each person within their respective function to look inwards to detect where the opportunities are for us to improve our country and build forward better by integrating the principles of circularity into our economic development models. As Vice President of the Caribbean within the Executive Committee of Pal America's Parliamentary Network on Climate Change, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight the new Pal America's online tool it's environment and sustainability, mapping the strategies and plans of the Americas and the Caribbean, which is a compilation of national environment and climate change action plans and commitments, including our own national strategies for transitioning to a circular economy. This tool can be used to understand what exists here in Trinidad and Tobago, and to learn about the experiences of other countries in the hemisphere. Since there's not yet been a national strategy proposed for implementing 
circular economy in Trinidad and Tobago, the parliament can play an advocacy role in calling on the executive branch to develop a roadmap. When successfully done, a circular economy model can promote long-term economic growth and sustainable development by optimizing our production methods and encouraging behavioral change around the consumption of goods and extraction of resources, which respects the boundaries of the earth and is mindful of future generations. I like to quote a Native American proverb, which goes something like this. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. It is worth emphasizing that like any economic model, in our increasingly globalized and interconnected world, the success of a circular economy in Trinidad and Tobago will also need regional coordination, both here in the Caribbean and beyond. And this is why working with regional bodies like Pearl Americas and the Circular Economy Coalition for Latin America and the Caribbean, among others, is an important path. It's an important part of our pathway forward. However, one of the most prominent obstacles for a circular economy model is the lack of a national strategy and related regulatory frameworks, both nationally and internationally. Again, as members of parliament and staff, we have a key role in supporting the advancement and integration of a circular economic model through legislative oversight and budgetary functions to benefit the well-being of our constituencies and to contribute to a more sustainable and healthier planet. As we segue to the panel presentations, colleagues, I once again encourage you to be mindful of what you can contribute towards Trinidad and Tobago's transition to a circular economy. We are on a mission to identify strategies for its application in the national context. It's now or never. I am certain that this workshop will enlighten our future work and help provide insights to guide our next steps. At this point, may I just welcome our panelists and introduce as our first panelist, Ms. Vanessa Esslinger, Circular Economy Specialist and Coordinator of the Circular Economy Coalition for Latin America and the Caribbean. I now Thank give the floor much. to Ms. Esslinger. Welcome. Thank you very much, Senator Vieira. It is a pleasure and honor to be sharing this space with you today. Um, it's, uh, it's really uh, a great opportunity for me to be sharing um, this, this space with you. My name is Vanessa Esslinger. I work for the Circular Economy Coalition, it's been mentioned. The Circular Economy Coalition is an initiative whose mission it is to really strengthen that interministerial, intersectoral coordination, the multi stakeholder collaboration amongst countries in the region. And we are very pleased that Trinity Tobago actually is already a member of the coalition. We've been launched very recently, one year ago, and we're working on engaging more and more our partner countries. And I think this is the first step towards also uh, reaching out and, collab and starting collaboration. Um, I was asked for today to make a brief introduction on what is circular economy. And therefore, if you permit, I would like to share a brief presentation with you. Um, please, can you confirm that you see my presentation? Um, is it fine? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Well, yes. I'll start. Why do we 
talk about circular economy. Why do we need to transition to circular economy? It's been mentioned by many of the previous speakers, but I would just like to remind that it's actually a triple planetary crisis we're facing, right? We're facing the crisis of climate change. We're facing the crisis of loss of biodiversity, the crisis of um, pollution, and each of them as a result of our linear way of producing and consuming. If we look at climate change, it's been already mentioned, you know, we would like to limit uh, global warming to 1.5, but if we continue in business as usual, then we might reach a scenario of a global warming of three to even six degrees. If we look at biodiversity loss, actually, we know that in Latin America, we're losing biodiversity at a higher rate than in other regions of the world. And if we look at pollution, we know, thanks to FAO, that if we continue this business as usual, we'll have more fish, uh, more plastic than fish in the sea by 2050. So we really need to rethink how we do things. We need to look at the engine. If we compare it to a car, you know, we need to look at the motor, at the engine of how we do things, of how we produce and how we consume things. So far, we have been uh, yeah, mostly doing things in a very linear way. It's been said, we take things, we transform, we take the resources, we uh, transform them, we produce products with them, and then we dispose them. But that's very inefficient. We lose lots of resources and actually also lots of money, lots of financial resources. That is why we need to move to the circular economy, to a more circular way of doing things. I would like you, I would invite you to take a guess in the chat maybe, for those of you who want to participate also in the chat, please take a guess of how much food is thrown away or wasted globally on average. If you just briefly can share in the chat, oh sorry, I cannot see the chat, but um, as I am presenting, but maybe you can take a guess or for yourselves, um, it's about 30%. That's quite a lot. Then I would like you to take a second guess. Please share in the chat um, how much time, how much percentage do you think that we use our cars? If we consider that a day has 24 hours, so that's 100%, how much time in percentage do you think we actually use our cars on average? I'll give you a minute to maybe also share in the chat your thoughts um, or your guesses. And, uh, and then, um, yes, well, it's actually 4%. So 95 or 96 percent of the time our cars are actually parked or not used, which means we could use that resources much, much more efficient. If we look at our cell phones, our cell phones are full of very valuable materials, actually also gold. If we extract gold from a mine, uh, traditional mine, we can extract from one ton of ore, we can extract five grams of gold. Now, please take a guess again in the chat of how many grams of gold you think we can extract from one ton of cell phones. It's 150 grams of gold. That's an amazing uh, comparison. So you see, circular economy is the only way we can, one, uh, live within planetary boundaries, but on the other side also, it makes economic sense, right? So, um, how does a circular economy work? And for this, um, please stay with us, uh, with me. I don't want to make it too theoretical, but there's a few things that I hope you find interesting as a takeaway from from this presentation. So first of all, I'd like to share with you the three principles of circular economy. So, so the, the core of circular economy is that 
we try to eliminate waste and pollution by design. So it means rethinking from the beginning, how can we do things differently so that we don't produce waste from the, from the beginning. I can share with you an example from a very famous chocolate brand in, in Germany. We used to have those little tubes with a plastic, little plastic tub on it uh, or, or lid on it. Um, it was carton but plus plastic. It was a little tiny piece of plastic, but still it was plastic. So by redesign, they redesigned the shape of this carton um, uh, carton tube uh, and made it hectagonal, and so that they could also close it with the same material being carton, and uh, that eliminated the pla the bit of plastic. So you see how we can eliminate then waste by design. Also, we want to maintain products and, the, and materials as long as possible in, re, in use at their highest value. And what that means, I will go into detail more in a, in a minute. And then, of course, we want to regenerate natural uh, systems. We don't not only want to make less harm, we want to really improve the situation of our natural um, ecosystems, right? So now let's go a little bit more into, <laughs> into the theory. But as I said, this is really important because it's not only about theory. Understanding this means also um, being able to understand each um, economic opportunity actually there is behind of each of these circles you see on this diagram. So what you see is the famous uh, so-called butterfly diagram. On the left, I hope it's also your left, you see the uh, biological cycle. So it's all those materials that are also biodegradable, like as wood, for example, right? And on the right side, you have the technical side, the blue side. So these are materials that are not, um, cannot biodegrade, like metal. And I want to have a closer look on this side and, and tell you a little bit about um, these circles. So most of you know the uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, uh, recycle, but that there's actually more to this, right? And as I said, let's let's go a little bit more into detail about it. So reuse, we kind of know. Um, the a common example for this is the reuse of glass bottles, right? Um, so, for example, the, the milk bottle or any other uh, product you have, you can use in a glass. Uh, theoretically, in infinite time, you can reuse a glass bottle, right? And so this would also be avoiding waste by opting for a glass bottle instead of a plastic bottle. Then let's look at repair. That is also known to us. But what means repair? Repair means we have a product that we own and we tow it to a shop and he or she might help us, for example, if there's something broken with our bicycle to repair the pedal or the brake and it returns back to us. But then there's also the option to renew things. Uh, let's think, for example, of our mobile phones. Um, this is a case when uh, my phone is given back to a company or to a third um, service um, that, that is able then to reuse this product. For example, I can show you. Um, this is my cell phone. It looks quite fine from this side, but from the other side, it doesn't look too fine. I had some trouble with one little component, but I was not able to repair it. So if we look at it from a linear perspective, I would have, I would now would need to throw this away. But if there was an option to hand this in to some provider or service that would be able to disassemble this and use the components, then we're talking about circular economy, right? So if we talk about renewal or refurbishment, then we're trying to use the components uh, or use this, this phone, fix what is wrong, but then put it back to market. Then we also have remanufacturing. This is a situation where then we need really to, we can't save this phone anymore. We will take it apart. We will use its single components and use those in other products, right? And then we come to the famous recycle. That is the one we all know. And we kind of 
talk about very general, but you see there's a difference between all these different stages. And that is why I think it's so important um, to differentiate um, because we can benefit from the value at each of these stages in different ways. So if we talk about recycle, it's recycling, then in the in a more like let's say um, conceptual way, it's actually only about reusing the material. So not the components, only the material, the glass, the plastic, the aluminium that is contained in um, in a product. So for example, for aluminium, by the way, um, if we recycle aluminium, we can save up to about I think it was ninety five percent of carbon emission, and we can save up to 80% of energy just by recycling aluminum. And then last but not least, we also have the uh, stage of recuperating. So that is at a point where there is no more chance to um, make use of the materials in a meaningful way, then in the end, there's no other chance but to burn it. That's of course the least desirable thing we want. Uh, and as you see, there's kind of a hierarchy Right. The first thing we want to try and see to do is to how to see and how to design things differently so we can avoid waste. And the least thing we want to do is recuperate or incinerate waste, which is actually, unfortunately, the most common thing that happens. I'd like to share two more things with you, and that is the difference between eco-efficiency and eco-effectiveness. If we think of efficiency and, for example, in lightning and we want to construct a building let's say and we want to make lighting more efficient then we could think of using lead uh, illumination instead of normal illumination right this is saving energy of course yes but if we think of it from an eco-effectiveness point of view then we would think about an option that is the most effective in terms of how do you use less energy and that would mean for example to construct the building in such a way that we don't need lighting or artificial lighting at all it would mean constructing a building in such a way that we have for example big windows yeah so and that would help us to uh, not need lighting from the beginning okay so that's a really um important thing also to distinguish and then circular economy or one thing that also um is 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 the, let's say uh key to circular economy is to think of how we can uh think of using a product as a service how can we move away from owning things from consuming things to being users of things and i'm sure you all know examples of these please share examples in the chat of uh, of things we don't actually need to buy we only borrow maybe or or use as a service instead of a product and i'd like to share one example with you that is for example the service of uber i don't want necessarily to have the car i just want to be able to get from a to b i want the service of being able to move from one place to the next and that is the principle then so of product as a service so let's try to rethink and not own things but use them um well and and with that i'd like to kind of close the conceptual part of of, of what is circular economy and and kind of some elements that um that are uh, critical or key to circular economy if there's one thing i'd like you to get a to, to come out of, of this um, little introduction to circular economy uh, is then it is let's rethink, let's redesign. Circular economy is really about redesigning, rethinking and system thinking. We too often also think linear. For example, if we think about recycling plastic. Of course, it's fine that we are eliminating, eliminating plastic out of the environment, but New studies have shown that sometimes recycled plastic is even worse for human health than virgin plastic. So we really need to think in systems to be able to avoid that um, making a solution on one hand will cause another problem on the other hand. Well, with this, I'd like to um, leave it at that. Just um, some benefits of circular economy have mentioned have been mentioned already of course employment um, mitigation of climate change and the use the much more efficient use of resources 
Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I invite you to please also follow the activities of the Circular Economy Coalition. Uh, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to contact me. I'll also share my contact in the chat. I'm available. And with that, um, I wish all of you also a remaining very interesting uh, conversation and exchange. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Ms. Esslinger. Um, the takeaway, as you say, is let's rethink and redesign our systems, our products and services. So thank you for taking the time to speak with us and for sharing your very enlightening presentation. I will now give the floor to Mr. David Oswald. He's the founder and president of Design and Environment Inc., a specialized eco-consultancy. He is also a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society and associate faculty member with the Royal Roads University in British Columbia, Canada. Mr. Oswald. Great. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thumbs up. Good. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Vieira, and uh, thank you very much to uh, Parlamericas and uh, the honorable attendees from the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I look forward to sharing some of the experiences we've had uh, as a team working on issues related to the circular economy. So my uh, role here is to talk uh, less about the conceptual model of the circular economy, but more, I guess, perhaps in practical sense of how are some ways we can go about implementing these concepts and um, share some lessons learned from uh, my team and our partner in, in doing that, and specifically on the role of data monitoring and reporting in, uh, in, uh, to achieve circular economy principles. So first I wanna talk about the circular economy and data. So we've seen this uh, diagram already, which is quite a well-known one. I'm actually gonna talk a bit more about the left-hand side of this, which is the biological systems. And I've just lighted, highlighted here um, the, uh, the role of, of processes and then correspondingly the data that we need to have to understand how these processes are working. Um, so we have energy and material input, material and energy output, and then we have to look at exactly how those um, systems are working and where can we gather data to better understand and control and then ultimately make policy legislation uh, and guidelines strategies to uh, help to change existing processes. So in terms of data, so we have inflow, outflow and process data needed at different levels. This is a very important concept I think is not often discussed enough um, is that the circular economy works at different levels. You have organizational level, you have municipal level, you have national level, and you need to identify exactly what are the levels you have control. If you're making legislation policies or guidelines, where you target them, right? Is it at the organization enterprise level? Is it at a state level? Is it at a national level? Or is it a regional level? So aggregated data needed at the municipal level. So you need municipal level data, such as environmental statistics, uh, and draws and impacts on natural resources because we are drawing on nature in order to make much of what we make from an ecosystem service, service standpoint. But one thing we really need to have, and we run into this a lot, is systematic regular cover coverage of quality assured data. And if there's one problem, we work widely across the Caribbean on these issues. And this comes up all the time in pretty much every country that we've worked in. And we've worked in at least 10, 12, 15 countries. So you need to have that systematic and regular coverage and there needs to be quality assurance in place. And one common issue that we also run into is a lack of capacity for data acquisition. Uh, and this is in fact what we, uh, what we get hired to do as a lot is to build that capacity. Uh, we also lastly need to recognize that there's a value chain in information acquisition in terms of decision making. So data is, is, is great, you know, especially if it's quality assured data and it's, it, but data is not information. So we need to translate that data into information and that means making it meaningful. So if it's, for instance, if it's satellite data, that may mean classifying it into land cover types, or if it's uh, aggregated statistical data from a MET station, you need to turn it into something like a monthly average of precipitation levels. That's turning it into something that you can actually sit around at a table with various different experts 
the legislators or whomever, and then make decisions, right? So this is, we call this the value chain from data to information to decisions. And it's very important to the circular economy because we can have all the data in the world, but if we don't have proper interpretation and transformation of that data into information, it won't be that useful. And then also we like to build into this, this model here, an iterative system review. So we're working in, uh, as highlighted before, with respect to the last IPCC report that has been issued, uh, is the fact that we're, we, are, we are in a different stage now. We're in a non-linear and highly destructive era in the history of humanity and the Earth system. So it's not, we're not living in static time. So we need to have iterative processes built into even legislation and regulations to ensure that you know, we may come up with a regulatory regime, but we have to analyze it. And this is in this, the school and concept of adaptive management and review that to review it, uh, whether or not our governance model is actually achieving the goals that we want it to achieve. So in terms of uh, data requirements, data sharing is an absolute must. And I'll talk a bit about this in terms of the, uh, the context of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as Antigua and Barbuda. You, we, you have to have that. We're moving into the era of open data. And this is a tricky one because Typically, organizations are used to collecting their own data, processing their own data, managing and, and using their own data. Uh, oftentimes, from a governance standpoint, there's cost recovery processes in place for different ministries, and they don't want to share their data because they make money selling the data. But you have to get past that. There has to be mechanisms, maybe at certain types of data that can be shared, monthly averages, maybe it's not the raw data, but you must, must, must have data sharing agreements in place. The other key principle with data is transparency. So a lot of this has to do with public engagement. So if you want to engage the public to change their behavior, you have to engage them. You have to be transparent to some degree about what you're doing and hopefully get them to buy into these processes. And we found that, uh, and I will show you, data sharing and processes for, doing, for, uh, for uh, facilitating stakeholder buy-in are very, very useful in that regard. You need data at the national level for environmental information systems. So governance, policy, and regulations across ministries. So, so national level data is required uh, to engage in governance and therefore make policies and regulations and then also to, to uh, follow up on whether or not some of the policies and regulations are working. In addition, uh, in our work, we deal a lot with national reporting. So national reporting to multilateral environmental agreements, specifically the, uh, the Rio conventions. And those are for those of you that are familiar with those processes, which I'm sure many of you are, they are very, very data intensive processes and they exist. So we will not make progress on climate change mitigation or adapt very good reporting. You need data to, to do that. Fortunately, if you align that process with the circular economy, you can make some tremendous progress. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about, um, I'm gonna go fast here. So if you have any questions, please make note of them uh, and we can, we can talk about them in the discussion period. So parties to the MEAs require data for the re re reporting. So parties to the UNFCCC, UNCBD, and UNCCD, these are, as highlighted uh, by Ms. Eslinger, the crisis we're in is one of biodiversity, climate change, pollution, and land degradation. Those are the big, big issues. Uh, and in fact, biodiversity is uh, arguably the biggest crisis we're in right now, according to the planetary boundaries model. All of these are captured within three Rio conventions and data is required for each one of these. From a national governance standpoint, we have ministries of agriculture, transportation, energy, uh, forestry, and so forth. All are, are participants in reporting to these MEAs. So what we're seeing right now and what we've started to see a lot of countries take is this what's called an open data paradigm, which is emerging more and more in which data sharing uh, with the public so open data sharing with the public and amongst different agencies is helping to make progress on sustainable development. Now, in order to make, uh, to get an NEIS, a National Environmental Information System to work, you have to have effective data acquisition and management process in place. And this is where these data sharing agreements are absolutely imperative. If you don't have those, it just won't work. So I wanna give you some, a brief example. Uh, we've worked in St. Lucia and Antigua and Barbuda, as well as across the Caribbean with five Cs, doing regional and uh, national, uh, regional information, environmental information systems, as well as national. So obviously St. Lucia and Antigua were national ones. I'm just going to briefly show these. And again, we can talk in more detail during the workshop. So this is, I'm just going to switch uh, to uh, Safari. 
So this is what we've done uh, for Antigua and Barbuda. And so this is real, like this is an actual live system currently working, launched in October. This is an Antigua's, and this is their National Environmental Data and Information System. And the way we've broken this up is into an NEIS. There's two major components. So this NEIS is more for reporting, right? So use it for, I'm gonna show you just briefly here, um, a report for um, one of the, on the left side of the circular economy, um, uh, paradigm is looking at where are their vulnerabilities. So this report here that's going to come up hopefully quickly uh, is going to show you um, what they're, how they report on beach change. Here we go. So I'm just going to go down here. So this is a series of all the reports they do. And these ones, the beach change is actually something they'd use for the UNF triple C. Uh, and as you look at this, you will see actual live data here, which they are using and sharing amongst different agencies on the data they've gathered for the changes in sea, sea level rise and its impact on beaches, which uh, is an issue in Trinidad and Tobago as well. So those of you familiar with Antigua and Barbuda, you can see there's Barbudos up here and Antigua's down here. And this live data here is actual data that they've gathered in profile changes. They've looked at the changes in beach profile as a result of sea level rise, okay? Uh, so that's the NEIS and the NRI. So the other kind of component to this is a data warehouse. So this is where uh, it's an inventory of natural resources. So I'm just gonna show you one example here uh, quickly. Of a map, so this is what you'd use just to gather the data and take a look at what's going on. And I'm gonna show you a map of um, land degradation. So this would be for something they would use for the UNCCD, for the Land Degradation Convention. So quickly here, you can see a map. And this is, again, this is built uh, with a GeoNode, which is an open data. It's not proprietary, um, very easy to integrate with other systems. And you can see here quickly, just the areas in Antigua that are are subject to land degradation, whether it be from induced drought or overgrazing or whatever it might be, okay? So that's just a quick example of a system that gathers data, integrates it together, that can be used to then support uh, circular economy principles. So um, uh, we've taken our experience with those different countries and then adapted it into one kind of uh, a generic approach that we call core EIS. And I'm just gonna show it's basically that, it's, uh, it, it's that platform, but uh, it is, just a sec here, I'm gonna try and find the, the right slide. Sorry about this. So what we've developed is a way of operationalizing this to be applied in different contexts. And when we call this, this is called core EIS, it's an information system. And now I'm just gonna show you, I mean, this is basically what we are doing with uh, Antigua and Barbuda and St. Lucia. But one thing I wanna highlight here is the benefits to compile data, to reuse the format and to streamline decision-making. But the big benefit here is collaboration, okay? So you can see here how it works. You have data contributors, you have a platform, you have focal points for, for MEAs and the actual MEA reporting. Now in the context of circular economy, this is very important because you have multiple data contributors, could be organization level, could be municipal level, could be national, integrated into one central repository, and then you can make actionable, actionable decisions. So these focal points for MEAs, but for a circular economy approach, that could be ministries within the government or what have you, okay? So I'm just gonna switch back to the presentation here. So what does this all mean in terms of actual um, usability and how does it relate to then the circular economy? And one of the critical issues as highlighted um, uh, by Senator Vieira is the climate catastrophe that we're entering right now, right? Uh, and one of the big issues that is coming up increasingly in Trinidad and Tobago and other countries is disaster risk reduction, disaster risk. So, um, this is the model, this is from Guyana CDC. So if we're gonna, how, what's the relationship between the circular economy uh, and this kind of data paradigm for MEA reporting? Well, we need to look at risk. Like how does risk play into this? Because we are in an era of increasingly increasing vulnerabilities and risks. 
So this is the paradigm for instance in the context of agriculture. So what are the natural has hazards that are facing Trinidad and Tobago? Floods, landslides, sea level rise, droughts. Those are the big ones, okay? And this is the standard paradigm for risk, risk analysis. In this case, it's agricultural risk mapping, risk identification, prevention, mitigation, financial protection, preparedness, response, and recovery. Things will happen. So how do we prepare and how do we align with this with, this, with the circular economy? Well, we do so by engaging with stakeholders, number one, that's what I tried to highlight before, and seek ways in which we can gather data, okay? So this is from some work that we actually have done in, in Trinidad and Tobago, and some of you may be familiar with these locations. Uh, this is with ICA, our client and partner there. Um, you have to have stakeholder engagement. This is for agricultural risk mapping. The top right there is within, uh, in, about in the southern part of Trinidad, which is uh, Puday Lagoon. Uh, the bottom right is Puday Lagoon, is where we're looking at uh, water management systems, and the left is a place called Orange Grove Estate. Okay, so our job there was to look at how do we build risk maps and how do we train people to do risk mapping. And these are the risk maps we came up with, okay, uh, by using some algorithm type of work and then the data integration that we uh, that I showed you that we do. And this is, these are before, and I'm going to show you the after. So in the right, you see Kuda Lagoon. The dark blue means high risk, prone to flood. And then the lighter green means less prone to flood. So those are familiar with the south and Kuda area. This is a very low-lying place that once you get storm surges and high rains, it just floods. It's like a big pool, right? All these farmers there are small-scale farmers, smallholder farmers, whereas in Orange Grove Estate, you have SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. So in both cases, you can see there's a dark blue and light blue, there's some flood prone areas, right? But what we were able to do with this data integration is to look at, lose, gather data, on-site inspections, say, look, you've got some areas of potential risk here. We might wanna have some policies in place, maybe insurance and so forth, change practices to uh, respond to these events or be more resilient to inevitable changes. And if you don't do that, I'm just gonna switch to this, this is what happens. And ironically, this is shortly after uh, these images I'm gonna show you. Just one sec here. Here uh, was a month after, this is that same area. That, that research we were doing was in July. This is in August. This is what happened after the big rains. And this is what happens when you're not prepared. These were people on top of the on top of their houses. They had no other place to go. And this is an example of the infrastructure. This is inside map. Okay, what's going on here? Oh, it's rough. Be careful. So those are actual real images uh, from what occurred a month after we had done this work just to highlight the importance that this is real stuff and this can help to make decisions to mitigate these types of risks. So what is the parliamentary response in closing? Policy and legislation can guide this transformation to a circular economy. And this is what I think we should, we need to discuss today is what are some regulatory frameworks, policies and strategies that we can use to redirect society towards a more circular and climate risk reduced economy. This is one of the most powerful for paths forward. So integrative design thinking can help climate change adaptation and mitigation, disaster risk reduction, and then fostering the green and blue economies as well as a circular economy. We need to incentivize circularity at the organization, municipal, regional, and the national level, but we have to also regulate unsustainable activity and support those decisions with data, thus showing the rationale such as that, uh, what I've shown today. And just at the top here, you can see in this Venn diagram, the intersection of climate action, circular economy and disaster reduction, risk reduction is right in the center there. And that's where we need to work. All right, so I think I went over time, I'm sorry, but uh, if, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them during the Q&A period. Wow, so the integrative design thinking core EIS platform, national resources inventory. I like all those as concepts. I can see the benefits and usefulness. So thank you, Mr. Oswald, for helping us appreciate the value of data, the value chain of data to information, and the need for data-driven decisions, policies, and guidelines. You've also underscored what 
Ms. Esslinger was talking about, the need to change practices and for integrative design thinking. So thanks again. May I now invite Dr. Sherwin Millet. He is a sustainability consultant at the College of Science, Technology and Applied Arts of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Millet, welcome. Good morning, everyone. I am so gratified that I am getting to participate in this um, this workshop this morning. And I feel like um, I almost don't need to be here between um, Madam Speaker and yourself, um, Senator and David and Vanessa. You all have really covered a lot of the length and breadth of what we what we should be discussing as part of circular economy. So what I would to pivot a little bit, I guess, um, what I guess we will talk about, or I will talk about, is a little bit about the research that I have been doing and how that will, um, may intersect with this discussion. My focus has primarily been on the business side of circular economy and how we're able to create the kernels and grow the, 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 the propensity of business locally specifically in um in developing circular economy and like everyone has mentioned previously the need for data and you'll see me say it a couple of times you cannot manage what you cannot measure and data is key information is key in our ability to to move forward so in starting off when i when i was looking at the questions asked of me um where are we in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of circular economy? Um, there are three core aspects as we identified, but the use of regenerative resources. Um, we are still in very nascent stages where we are exploring renewable energy. Solar, wind, the Northeast trades actually give us quite an advantage. Uh, TGU in terms of their efficiency in the, um, the twin cycle approach that they use for the generation of electricity. Um, we also want to maximize the life of the resources that we do use. Now, we are moving towards, in my estimation, a circular economy. I'm sorry, a recycling economy, but that doesn't take it quite far enough. What you want to do, like I explained before, in terms of the circular economy is to actually replace the use of virgin materials as far as possible. And then when you are returning it, you either return it as a nutrient to the environment or you convert it to energy for additional use. So we do have some recycling that occurs. Primarily, um, we look at Swimcall, who collects a lot of the um, materials, plastics, uh, some electronics, aluminum, um, tetra packs, but there are also private sector interests in paper, glass, iron, and electronics. Um, the final step, or I wouldn't say the final step, but the next major step towards the circular economy is us looking at using the waste streams as a resource, right? And like I said, we do have some kernels of uh, activity. If you look at the Cove Eco Industrial Park, they are attempting to create what we would call industrial symbiosis, where the waste from one system is able to be an input into another. Um, in Trinidad, we have the flying tree. Um, uh, company, which is a, it's a company and an NGO that is using um, waste plastic as an input and sequestering that plastic in cement products, benches, construction blocks, and that type of thing. All right, so um, like I said, it's in the infancy and we'll move on. Now, key to, to, to Developing your circular economy system is an understanding of what materials exist in your system. And with my research, I was looking at something called material flow analysis, which is basically an analytical method that allows us to take a snapshot to quantify materials in the system and where it's accumulated. Now, I used plastic very specifically to kind of identify the potential of using this, um, this methodology for uh, getting data. So a key aspect of circular economy in terms of from the business perspective is identifying industrial symbiotic relationships, 
right? That quantification of that materials and allowing companies to build symbiotic relationships, right? So um, Li Chan et al, I'll say et al in this case, right? They did note that industrial symbiosis locally is being driven by commercial interests and not being fueled by government subvention, which I think is a good thing. It means that the businesses in the country are looking to be innovative, looking to be cost effective, looking to be um, efficient in the use of resources and looking for um, opportunities for, um, for, our, for, 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 for business. This is just a snapshot of the result of the MFA as it uh, deals with plastic. So we have about 129, 130 metric tons of plastic imported a year. Um, that's in excess of over 100 million US dollars, if I remember correctly. And it goes through the system. However, we put about 96,000 metric tons, which is roughly 80%, 74% of the plastics that come into the country, both directly and indirectly, into the landfill, right? Now, this is a resource. Part, we do have some challenges along the low-grade um, plastic film, right? But there are opportunities to do that. So by collecting this type of information, like uh, David was explaining, you are now able to say, okay, where is the opportunity that we're looking for? Where are the opportunities to save on the uh, use of foreign currency, for example, that can be used as an input into something else? So for example, we do have a cement plant in Trinidad and Tobago. So one possible use of plastic waste, if we're not able to recycle it in its entirety, would be used to, for example, to avoid the use of some of the natural gas in the production of cement and burning with, of course, the appropriate filters and so on on the stacks, burning uh, plastic to um, heat the kilns and that carbon and those residuals get in, um, sequestered into the cement itself, right? So those are some of the activities there that we can, that we can look at. Finally, when we, we sit down and start thinking about the ecosystem, and that was where a lot of my research thinking was, is how do we establish this supportive and motivating ecosystem, right? And the first thing I call is the availability of data for research, entrepreneurship, management, and support of industrial symbiosis. A financial, um, we have to be able to finance the ecosystem itself. It is absolutely essential that we consider public-private partnerships, and a very supportive legislative agenda. So things like the environmental protection, um, the beverage container bills, which has been moving through parliament for a very long time, could be a key aspect in our ability to incentivize the, the use of plastic or to reduce the use of some types of plastic, right? Um, the inclusivity of circular economy thinking in your legislative agendas where relevant and possible. So for example, we, we were looking at, for example, the, the procurement bill. Could there have been aspects of that that could have been used to support circular economy, right? Um, the leveraging of independent entities such as the EMA and swim call to support and oversee the system. Um, is there a standing committee from a parliamentary standpoint that can help plan and guide the process overall, establish that roadmap, right? And include that consideration in a number of the national committees um, that are looking at development of Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, um, budgetary support, and of course, participation in international associations that support circular economy are all um, excellent ways that the parliament can assist in not just um, building the, the, the system, but providing guidance and um, authenticity to what we are doing. So in closing, uh, the government of course is not solely responsible for the development of circular economy. They are part of a ecosystem that needs to include the actors such as government finance, that's banking sector, so on and so forth, academia, 
business, NGOs, and industry as a whole. So um, in terms of assisting to create that, that environment, it is important. Like David was saying, it's not just about data, but information. And entrepreneurs require information to connect the dots between opportunities and profits. So um, we need to help them identify the opportunities, support the, develop the development of those nascent entrepreneurs, incentivize um, and provide rewards for activity and effort and allow the movement of waste, possibly across national borders, because you do have considerations of economies of scale that you have to consider for it to be financially viable, because again, entrepreneurs are looking for the most part for that type of financial um, reward, all right? So we also have to strongly consider the creation of um, value added activity from the waste streams. And there are a couple of um, examples globally. The one that comes to mind to me is the Risen um, Incubator in Arizona that is aligned to their waste management company. And they are promoting the use of waste from the waste stream into businesses. And I believe they've, they've identified that the potential was something like 100 million US over five or 10 years or something like that. All right, so my presentation was really short. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, just as an additional kind of idea, this is the ecosystem that we are looking at and how an incubation model is able to assist in terms of getting the actors together, the communication, overcoming the obstacles that we have to create businesses that are driving circular economy. And this becomes important because what we consume as consumers is driven primarily by what is made available to us by businesses locally. So we do have some challenges because Trinidad, of course, is a small market when you look at it from a global scale and as such has very little uh, influence on some of the packaging or some of the products that we consume. We have, we're consuming more and more advanced um, products and we are not well placed to deal with the disposal side of things, right? How do you disassemble a cell phone and take out the, 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 the valuable components of it. So a lot of the time, what tends to happen is that we export um, our waste, recyclable waste, and we, we are losing out on an opportunity in that respect. All right, so um, much like David said, I look forward to the next part of the conversation uh, in terms of if anybody has any questions for me. And, um, you know, this is a great conversation as we're going forward. Thank you very much. Lots of challenging questions you have put there. How do we establish and build the right ecosystem? How can we reuse materials and use waste streams as a resource looking for the value added? How can we identify industrial symbiotic relationships and better use techniques and tools like materials flow analysis and the circular economy incubator. I like as your takeaways, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Data is key and this is a shared responsibility. It's not government's sole responsibility. So thank you very much, Dr. Millet for a very informative and insightful presentation. May I now invite Ms. Shan Coffey Young. She is the waste management educator, trainer, and founder and CEO of Seal Environmental Services Limited. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Vieira. And thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Most people don't get it right on the first try. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I am the entrepreneur in the bunch that Dr. Mollett, I'm one of the entrepreneurs that he was just referring to, um, because we do need to be supported, um, and we do have ideas and, and opportunities and desires to work in this space, 
However, we need um, the supporting mechanisms to be there. So just a little bit um, about SOCIAL. SOCIAL is a social enterprise um, and we specialize in three main areas. So we do based education and literacy programs for children and youth. Um, we also do wage reduction and circular economy training, hence my reason for being here today, um, for individuals and businesses. Um, and we also provide consultancy support for um, larger waste management projects. Um, and the newest thing is that we are actually looking at getting into um, working with food and organic waste as our next step. So let me just jump right in. Great. So what I'm, um, and now that I'm sharing, I can't see anybody. So I'm hoping you guys can see what I am seeing, right? Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is education. As a colleague told me, I have the hardest job because my role and what I have decided to take on as this Herculean task is to change mindsets. That does not happen overnight. And uh, working in the circular economy space is definitely no different. So I'm just going to, well, Vanessa shared about the principles already. And I'm also in this beautiful position where I'm just this hush posh, this beautiful mix of everything that went before me, of parts of Vanessa's, parts of David, parts of uh, Showin's presentation. Um, so I'm going to be um, reiterating some of the things that they've said, but also introducing you specifically to some education strategies. I, um, I'm going to be talking about knowledge gaps, adoption and stakeholder involvement, because everybody mentioned that, um, and the role of women and youth in this circular economy. So I'd like to, to just share a couple of things about myself. Um, one of the things I've mentioned is that I have been working in the waste management space. This year will be 17 years. I look nice. I don't look it, right? Um, but I have been doing this for quite a long time um, and having both public and private sector experience and now as an entrepreneur myself, um, working in this space and really trying to, to shape it. Um, as I tell people, waste is very sexy to me. It's not one of the sexier environmental spaces. Young people are not running to it you know, with eager anticipation, but it is sexy to me. When my husband hears that, I have to remind him it's not sexier than him though, but it definitely is something that I'm really very passionate about. But one of the critical parts and the reason for me starting Sayel in the first place is that I saw the need for changing the way we educate. It's not just about what we say anymore, it is about how we say it. And I've seen the effects of ignoring that and the ramifications and the consequences that have arisen because we've just focused on the what and we have not focused on the how, which is what I am going to be talking about today. So Vanessa mentioned these things already, um, which is the, the three principles of the circular economy. Um, but I just want to reiterate that even with all of these things, we can't necessarily move forward if education is not at the center of everything. No matter what decisions we make, uh, strategies we develop, if we don't realize that education plays a major role in what we would like to execute, then all, we'll, all our work, all our effort will just fall short, okay? It doesn't matter all of the programs that we have and all of the, the things for the, for the collection of recyclables like the eye care program. But if people don't know about it, then the program will just exist by itself. Yeah, so I want to reiterate the importance of education. So here is where you get to interact with me a little bit. And I just want you to put true or false in the chat. All right, the question for you is, does an increase in knowledge 
correlate to a change in behavior. So I want you to go in the chat and tell me if that statement is true or false. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes because I want to see your answers. Wonderful. I, I'm seeing them coming in. Yeah, you can, you can, you can weigh in. It's okay. All right. Um, so tell me if you think it's true or false, and then I'll let you know if you're right. Great. He might says it depends. No, he might. <laughs> it doesn't quite depend, <laughs> but I'll explain in a bit. Okay, good. So I'm seeing the responses coming in. So the answer to this question is false. An increase in knowledge does not necessarily correlate to a change in behavior. How many times do we know things, we get more information, but it doesn't mean that it, it has motivated us to spur into action immediately. I like to always use myself as, as an example, okay? So I had this habit of not taking the full course of my antibiotics. So the doctor would say, Shan, I need you to, because he knows me so well, I need you to take the full seven days or the full 10 days. Do not stop at day five because you're starting to feel better. Okay, doc, no problem. Sean, you're hearing me, right? Okay, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Day five, I feeling good. What did I do? Stop taking the antibiotics. <laughs> I understand the importance of, of taking the full course. I understand the role that they are playing in terms of helping fight the infection that I was currently experiencing, but I started to feel good on day five, so I stopped taking it. All right, so that's just an example of how an increase in knowledge does not necessarily correlate to a change in behavior. All right, so those of you guys who said true, now you know why. Yeah? Try to get my slides to move here. All right. So, Vanessa spoke about this, um, and Dr. Millette also mentioned it as well, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a different perspective as it pertains to the waste management hierarchy. So it was mentioned that there is a waste management hierarchy, yes, and it does govern and dictate how we should effectively be managing our waste, right? Um, it was mentioned already that we, we tend to just look at the disposal end of things, right? But waste management, the definition of waste management incorporates generation, collection, treatment, processing, and disposal of waste. All of those things is what makes up transportation. All of those things is what makes waste management, right? So in the waste management hierarchy, you see the same thing that we're talking about today with the circular economy. It, it encourages a rethinking and a redesigning of our processes. Then after that, we have the R's. We have reduce, reuse, but there are some other R's that we haven't necessarily, and Vanessa mentioned some of them, that we haven't necessarily been paying a lot of attention to. We have repair, we have repurpose, we have refill, right? So all of these, all of these principles can also be incorporated. As entrepreneurs, um, I also encourage um, some of my colleagues to incorporate things like having a refill program for their product. So if I buy, um, like a, a friend of mine, if she she has her um, hand sanitizer in small glass bottles, so when you purchase, when your hand sanitizer is finished, you can go back and get a refill and you get like a little discount off um, on your hand sanitizer. And to encourage other practices like that in the space, because we understand that the goal should be to um, divert as much weight, waste, sorry, away from the landfill as possible. And then we have recycling, 
we have to understand that recycling is taking an old product and turning, turning it into a new one. The only true recycling company that we have in Trinidad and Tobago is Carib Glass Woods because they take old bottles and make new ones. Everybody else either collects or processes waste to be shipped out to uh, be recycled. Yeah, um, even um, for paper, there's some level of local recycling done by Green Bay Paper. Um, but of course, we still have a vast majority that is shipped out as well. And nothing is more circular than composting. It mimics um, what happens naturally in nature, but giving it um, a little jolt, a little turpentine, as we say, to get the process happening. All right? Um, then we have things like residual management, and things that's where we have material recovery, where things like waste and energy sit. We have any residuals that's where you'll find incineration. And of course, at the very, very end, you'd also have disposal. So number one, I have a desire to see waste differently. And we talked about that, waste as a resource, yes? The production of waste should be seen as a design flaw rather than the inevitable byproduct of the things we make. So I'll say that again. The production of waste should be seen as a design flaw rather than the inevitable byproduct of the things we make. So we have to rethink our relationship with waste. The amount of waste produced is an indication of how well we can manage our resources. So if we were looking at ourselves, current situation, current scenario, we are not managing our resources well, just simply based on the amount of waste that we produce. Yes? Um, so I talked about the three R's are no longer enough. We have to look at the other ones that I've already mentioned. Um, and like a big, a big thing, especially, is food packaging, right? And the goal for food packaging is that it should remain in circulation a little longer before it goes to the landfill. Because oftentimes we have things that we know about single-use plastics. Those things just go, end up going to the landfill, right? So we ourselves have to um, repurpose the things that we use. And this, I have this circular... I have this circle of life. So I am a huge Disney fan. Lion King is one of my favorite Disney movies, right? And Rafiki talks about the circle of life. Nature itself has no concept of waste. Think about it. When the tree dies, goes into the soil, nourishes the soil, then what happens? Another tree pops up. Grasses um, are present. So nature itself has no concept of waste. So therefore, it's us uh, thinking like nature, basically, and creating that circle so that whatever does come out at the end really and truly is to be considered um, this no longer useful product. By returning the nutrients to the soil, we can enhance our natural resources. And lastly, The, the, the thing that we, in one of the knowledge gaps, we think that it's impossible to achieve. It's not impossible. We need both the willingness and the ability to, to make the change, right? And to embrace the change. One of the things that is happening um, naturally is that the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards is actually working on a circular economy standard, which is to be developed and also there are also members of ISO, the International Organization for Standards, and the ISO is also working on developing a circular economy standard. So that's globally, that will trickle down, of which Trinidad and Tobago um, is a member through the TTBS, and the TTBS is also working on developing a local standard for circular economy, of which I am a part of the Mirror Committee. So I can tell you that um, as information. Right, so in strategies, we talked about meeting, we talked about in stakeholder engagement, right? And you would have a myriad of stakeholders. You'd have stakeholders at the community level, you'd have children and youth, you would have businesses, you'd have uh, public sector, you would have the government. So you have multiple stakeholders, both internally and externally. So the goal is really to meet, meet the stakeholders where they are. 
sessions like these are really important because we get the opportunity to share some of this information with you um, so that in your engagement with either your internal stakeholder, which is your staff members, or your external stakeholders, those communities, organizations that you work with, you really need to meet them where they are. If they know nothing about circular economy, then you have to take the awareness approach. If they have some level um, of understanding of what it is, then you simply increase their knowledge and you communicate. Environmental communication is a two-way street. It's not one way. So therefore they have to, if there is any opportunity in communicating with them where there's evidence to prove otherwise, you share that. Because oftentimes we don't, we don't share the evidence that proves otherwise. We just let people talk. You know, we are in, Trin in Trinidad, right? We just let people talk. So you have to meet stakeholders where they are. Uh, Dr. Millet mentioned private public partnerships. And to me, that is essential moving forward. We don't need to look beyond the Caribbean region to see private public partnerships that work. We have the Sustainable Barbados Recycling Center right in Barbados, which is a beautiful example of a private public partnership that works and that has been working for more than 20 years. So we don't need to go outside of the region for examples. Show commitments through your words, Madam Speaker, and actions. Kaleem, Laurel, show commitments through your words and actions. Right? It's not just about saying things because it's nice to say them. They have to be followed up with tangible, positive action, right? Support those who are doing the work and see how your involvement can help boost what they're already doing. Oftentimes, maybe it's a Caribbean thing. We feel like, okay, I have to do this by myself. If I don't do it by myself, well, you know, I can't, I can't work with anybody else. But we can't continue to have that individualistic approach. A collaborative approach is what will really take us forward. You know this saying, if you want to go far, go alone. If you want to go further, go together, right? Um, empower citizens. Empowering citizens, we're just talking about commitment here, requires persuasion and not convincing. So let me explain. So convincing is... If someone has no idea, they don't believe in what you're saying, they think climate change is not real, you know, just using that as an example, um, then it would require convincing on your part because they, they already don't believe in what you're saying. But when you're persuading them, it's because they already see the benefit. So all I'm doing today is persuading you because you already see the benefit of the transition to circular economy and how it can help boost the work of the parliament and by extension, your other stakeholders. And one of the things that Madam Speaker spoke about was auditing your organization. And Dr. Millet also mentioned, you cannot measure what you do not know. Conducting an audit is extremely important. It helps you to be able to know what your current scenario is, but it also helps you to be able to design systems and approaches to deal with the waste that you're generating and any sort of redirection that may be possible, right? So for us uh, at SILE, that is something that we encourage, that is something that we do. We have trained staff to be able to conduct waste audits. And it is, it is a critical part of moving forward in the circular economy. Because you, you can't, if you don't know what you have, then how are you going to set up programs to deal with the waste? So adoption. Now we're talking about behavior change. And the Senator Vieira mentioned this, right? When we are when we are thinking about behavior change, we utilize the community-based social marketing strategy. And here it has four main principles. So, firstly, you select the behavior that you want to encourage. It means identifying the barriers and the benefits uh, to that behavior. And oftentimes we don't do that. We decide, okay. So I will tell Rhea, Rhea, I want you to walk with your reusable water bottle to work. But I haven't spoken to Rhea about one of those barriers. Does she have a reusable water bottle? Is there, um, is there any water coolers in work, right? So that she can refill it when she gets there. So we have to be able to not only select the specific behavior, that we want to achieve, 
but we also have to identify the barriers and the benefits from uh, not engaging. One of the, the one of the things that we also don't do is kind of test. Sometimes we just, you know, we it's it, I, I chalk it up to excitement. We just roll out strategies without testing them to make sure that they work. Right? Um, it is always advisable that you test your strategy on a small group of people before you roll it out in a major way. That gives you the opportunity to hear any concerns, any challenges. Um, people also might, they are seeing things with different eyes so they can give you examples, right? And then evaluating the program. So even if you don't evaluate your program, how would you know whether they're successful? So evaluation of the programs is very, very important. And moving from, um, from, from a linear economy, which is take, make ways to circular, and we're talking about getting people to change their behaviors, getting people to rethink, to reimagine um, what waste is like. These are the four main steps that you have to utilize. So the role of women. Women, I saw this beautiful quote by Marshall Alec, and I said I wanted to share it with you. Women can be the engines and souls of the circular economy. And I want to take this opportunity to share a little bit of my story with you here. So I, in terms of, of what I have been able to, when people see me and what they know about me is that you know, I am an award-winning environmentalist and advocate and waste educator. Um, I've been featured in a number of local and international publications from the CPT to waste management the world. Um, I'm, re I'm often referred to as a titan in the environmental space. That one I'm still getting to see. Still featured in WED. Um, I'm also the circular economy chapter holder for for Trinidad and Tobago for Port of Spain and the national section chair. Sean, can you speak up because we're not, we're losing, we're not hearing you. Oh, okay, great. Better now? Yes. Better now. Yes, you hear me, Tell me. You're cutting off and on. How is it now? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So, thanks. Right. Thanks. so tell me if if you thank you for telling me that kind of appear. If it happens again, please let me know. Right. Um, but for me, it wasn't always like that. You know, when I started in this space, I really thought that I didn't quite understand of or you know realize that what was I doing? Was this important? Will people, as we say, take me on? Will people pay attention to what I'm doing? And I decided that, you know what, this, this kind of work doesn't make sense anymore. I am done. Um, I was very ready to, that's it, pack up shop, as we say. And because I just felt like I couldn't do this anymore. And I was seeing other people around me in other spaces excelling. And I was wondering, what about me? When would it be my turn? So I did, I am a scientist as well by training. So I did what any scientist would do. I did research and I studied, right? I threw myself into books and videos and articles about entrepreneurship because I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was very good with climbing the corporate ladder. My ladder was painted and everything. It looked very pretty. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. So, and I kept saying, you know, being in waste management as a woman is also a male dominated space. And feeling like I just couldn't compete with the men. I just, they're, they're not going to listen to, what does this woman know about waste management? You know, but then I realized that it was okay for me to be a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. That it was okay 
for me to still try to figure things out, even though I didn't have all the answers. So now that I am in this space, and because I didn't see any examples, I decided to be the example. So women and, and their role in the circular economy, uh, because women have been primarily at the center um, of households and communities and are more receptive to circular behavior. Um, we're at the center of decision-making process and we can really dive into consumption and production behavior. And studies have actually shown that women are more willing to accept changes in their daily patterns for the sake of environmental protection and their family's well-being. Right, Senator Vieira? <laughs> and to all the other men that are on the call, um, the studies have also shown that we tend to be the most influential when it comes to decisions that could directly impact family habits, habits, energy consumption, waste production, and so on. So women have been and continue to be um, at the center of circular economy because of our role in the household, because of our role in communities, and for, because of our agility and resilience as it, as it pertains to the adoption of certain practices. So we have to continue to encourage women, encourage girls um, to also be in this space as well. As I said, for oftentimes, women involved in the waste management sector are often not at the leadership positions, often not at the helm. And as a result of that, um, we don't have the opportunity to really do that and you know, provide employment as Dr. Millet and they talked about and do all of these additional things as well. And then one of the favorite things um, that I enjoy about the work that I do is working with children and youth. See my big smile? It really gives me an added energy and boost. Um, and the young generation can influence their elders and can make them understand the environmental problems that are faced by us today. The youth can make them see that our environment is deteriorating day by day. And Senator Vieira gave the, the Native American quote that we borrow this planet from our children. The children are inheritors of what we do now. I am not happy with the planet and the country that I inherited from my ancestors. So therefore it is my job to ensure that my children inherit a better planet and country. And one of the things that we have done is you see that nice little book in the, on your screen there. I am now a children's book author. Um, and it's using that as a tool to encourage children and you to see ways differently, to be a teaching tool for parents, for teachers, um, as they continue to, to roll out uh, the importance of this kind of work. The youth voice is important. They aren't tokens. Value, we must value what they bring to the table and encourage them in the decision-making process and the execution of activities. So as I come to a close, the goal, I just wanted to issue a reminder, the goal of sustainable waste management is the first make less waste. Reuse consumables with final disposal coming down at the very, very end. And that is what circular economy encourages us to do. So recycling begins at the end of the get rid of it stage. However, circular economy goes right back to the beginning to prevent waste and pollution from being created in the first place. You have power, beware of what your purchasing power is. And of course, I cannot reiterate the need for extended producer responsibility and how critical it is in driving circular economy forward. We all are consumers. I buy things too. And if I don't have other alternatives on the market and I only have certain choices available to me, then that's the only choice I have to make. So we have to encourage the producers and the manufacturers to keep that in mind, to design products for us that can be recycled, repurposed, re-engineered, to stay in, to, in that circular loop as much as possible for them to take responsibility for the items that they are generating and not just pass it off on somebody else. In order for us to really drive circular economy forward, it's not just about us as consumers alone. 
everybody has a role to play. Government, business, individuals, communities, civil society, everybody has a role to play. And we all must take it on in order to really bring a uh, circular economy to where it needs to be. So guys, I want to thank you so much and I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotations. It is not always about doing things better, but sometimes we simply need to do better things. And that is where the circular economy sits. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Shan. I wholeheartedly agree that women can be engines be the engines and souls of the circular economy. And thank you, Shan, for highlighting the knowledge gaps, the value of waste, the need for circular economy training, the need for education, the need to empower citizens, and for being an example. Uh, you've pointed out that everyone has a role to play. The takeaways for me, <clears throat> changing mindsets does not happen overnight. Knowing about the problem is not enough. Talking about it is not enough. As Greta says, blah, blah, blah. We need to walk the talk. You underscored Vanessa's injunction about rethinking and redesigning our relationship with waste. And that if we are to tackle climate change, we need to change. We must show commitment, not just through words, but through action. As the Chinese say, talk do cook rice. We need to meet, to audit, to share, to act. So thank you to all panelists for offering such great insights, for your enlightening words about the, your experience with the circular economy and outlining opportunities for parliament to exercise its role in transitioning Trinidad and Tobago to a circular economic model. The next section will be a space of open dialogue between parliamentarians, parliamentary staff, and the panelists. Um, I think we have 10 minutes assigned for the Q&A. Um, we welcome panelists to pose any questions they may have to the parliamentarians and parliamentary staff and to the panelists as well. And to kick off, I have two questions from Senator Amrita Dionarine. First, can you explain how upcycling is different from recycling? And how does upcycling contribute to developing a circular economy? I think this will be for thrown out to everyone, so whoever can answer. And the second question from Senator Dionarine is. Waste management is important when crafting policies in the move towards a circular economy. What are some examples of incentives that worked in modifying behavior by governments, companies, and individuals to reduce waste or become zero waste? The floor is open. Thank you. Uh, shall I tackle the first one and I'll probably um, delve a little bit into the second question that you have. So how upcycling is different from recycling is that you are in the process of upcycling and my colleagues can always add to what I'm saying, is that you are now increasing the value of the item as opposed to uh, remanufacture, which is where, uh, where recycling is. So in upcycling, you would take the glass bottle or the plastic cup and whatever you turn it into, which would be something completely different, would now have a higher value. So that's the difference between recycling and upcycling. Simple, dif simple difference. And, and David and Showing can always add their dollars worth there as well. Um, and in terms of incentives, now I have a very love-hate relationship with incentives, and I'll explain why. Um, especially the financial kind. Now, I'll use our existing model as an example. So we all know in Trinidad and Tobago that you can take that glass bottles have a value in the sense that you can collect your glass bottles and it's, I think it's 10 cents and you can return them. So Christmas time, everybody goes with their case of MTs to the supermarket 
and get another case and they get a little $10 off um, the purchase of new items. However, the day Carib Glass Works and Carib Brewery decides to remove that incentive from the glass bottle, it may negate the behavior that all of these years that we've been doing. And I guess that, then, and not I guess, that is part of the impetus of the beverage container bill that the public also spoke about, right? Is assigning a value to these items to encourage the collection of the item, right? Um, but I'm also an advocate for using incentives in various ways, non-financial ones. So there are cases um, on the continent of Africa where for those who bring in, and I'll use plastics as an example, for those who bring in their plastics, um, they get a grocery card, you know, that they can now use that to go and make the necessary groceries or buy gas or whatever it is they need. Um, my colleague in Brazil, who is working with organic waste, if you um, give him your organic material, you get a percentage of finished compost returned to you. That's an incentive. So we could always look at our, our incentives broadly as opposed to just um, the, the popular go-to, which is an incentive of a financial kind. Um, I think it requires a little bit of creativity um, and it requires some innovation, um, not necessarily invention, but some innovation of some existing strategies and make it culturally relevant as well. I'm not an advocate for taking things from global north and just slapping it into Trinidad and Tobago. We have to see and understand that it works based on our culture, based on our laws, based on our experiences, and then use that to be able to develop the right kinds of incentives. Because there are incentives and then there are disincentives. But both are meant to work to encourage the behavior that we want. So we have to pay attention to that. Thank you, Shana. Um, before the other panelists weigh in, I would just want to ask participants to use the raise hand function if they would like to share any reflections or to ask questions to any one of the panelists. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists have contributions to the questions that Senator Dunarain posed. Um, I can, I completely agree. And I can only add that we can now take this to a macro level in terms of creating those incentives for companies and the industrial symbiotic approach is one of those things in terms of their ability to get inputs, raw materials from a waste stream that are at a fraction of the cost than you would if you had to now import these materials. So if we go back to plastics, so for example, there's research going on on being able to chemically recycle plastics back to its constituent parts. So that would now allow plastics to be used indefinitely, right? But again, economies of scale have to now kick in. So if we can now save that US currency to now say, okay, we can now essentially use the plastics locally to feed our own industry, that is an incentive that can be used. So we don't need to necessarily just look at the individual incentives alone. Right, um, and I'm gonna come back to, to, I think what David has more than <laughs> spoken about in great detail, that importance of data and information. And we can find those incentives buried in that, in that data. And just to, <clears throat> if I may, uh, just to add to that, I agree with uh, both of my colleagues, Sherwin and, and Sean. Um, the framework's already in place for this. So if you look at reporting to the SDGs for, through the uh, voluntary national review, um, there is an impetus for this kind of action nationally uh, in Trinidad and Tobago and other countries um, through the SDGs. So it's not like necessarily you're introducing a brand new, you know, a revolutionary concept. It's, it's looking at, you know, what are some existing national requirements for reporting to the UN and then how do you exercise that? And I think Sean's point is very relevant. You don't necessarily want to take a cookie cutter approach from the global north or from some other country. 
I mean, you know, in our experience working in, in countries that you would think would be quite similar, say like Dominica versus St. Lucia versus Antigua versus Barbados, you'd say, oh, okay, well, climate adaptation is the same with all of them. No, it's dramatically different. There's a lot of local issues, uh, you know, the geography, but then also sociocultural issues. So to uh, appropriately localize those initiatives, uh, I think is incredibly important. Thank you. I see speaker and is that George has a hand up speaker. Thank you, Senator Vera. Um, very, very interesting conversations. I, I just wanted to say this and um, Chan, sorry for mispronouncing your name, um, but I think incentives cannot be looked at in a desegregated way. Okay there must be a broad range of incentives. You made the point, education, awareness, okay? So while you may have fiscal incentives to, to, as part of your, your, your repertoire, other things have to be done in tandem. Another incentive is to me, um, apart from education, letting people see their role in what happens. So I remember once speaking to a guy earlier morning, I'm taking a walk, I'm speaking to this guy, and we're talking about um, Zika, okay? And he's telling me, I meet him on the road and he's telling me, I don't know about littering and so on and so forth. He was drinking something in a, a bottle or plastic or whatever. And as the conversation, so he spoke about litter and so on. And as the conversation was finished, he dropped his bottle in the road and continued. So, so clearly he doesn't see himself in, in, in what is going on. And again, as an incentive, is one of the points one of the presenters made about strategies, meeting the stakeholders where they are. So for instance, um, along uh, 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 a street where the eye care had placed uh, uh, a bin. And from my own observation passing in the morning, passing in the afternoon, I found that this program of collecting plastics and so on had to have been extremely successful because the bin was always overflowing with bags of plastic. The bin was removed because I guess people were using it for other purposes. It was removed completely. And I've always wondered, therefore, where have people gone who were using the bin for the proper purpose? So you move it from the community and you put it to Hilo or, sorry, Massey. All right? To me, that in itself is a disincentive because it's not where the user is, okay? Um, so it's not only fiscal, there are things. I, I, and for me personally, I see my grandchildren in this. I say to myself, oh God, I have to be better because I want the world to be a little better for them. So even if it's just for the, the selfish reason of my own grandchildren, I, I try a, a little harder. So we have to, uh, you know, approach it. Incentives from a whole range of things. And maybe by the time we remove the fiscal incentives, the behavior change would have come. And to me, if we change 50% of the behavior, we have ambassadors to help, help with the rest. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Speaker, just here. Um, she, she's very right in terms of looking at one of the other things I wanted to add is not just looking at incentives broadly, but also not looking at them in a silo. There needs to be other supporting mechanisms in order for incentives to work. And in 
my own experience that she talked about um, for her grandchildren and, and doing it, you know, even if it's just for her own selfish reasons. And her, her example, I mean, Madam Speaker, I can't tell you <laughs> how many examples that I have had with that. That actually created a Trini Mother Earth character to be able to tell people that they stink and dirty without saying it to the face, right? Because it is about encouraging them to engage in the kinds of behavior. And even with that same eye care program, I remember driving to the Barapur Secondary School approached me to work with them for their school race education program. I remember driving from Barataria to Barapur twice a week to collect plastic bottles from the school, but there was no eye care bin in Barapur. So then I had to take those bottles to Debe to drop them off. So as much as the children were eager, I mean, and at that time I was using my, my car, my personal vehicle, load up the car with plastic bottles, right? But the fact is, if they, would, if they didn't have me to support them, then where would, where would all of those plastic bottles go to? Same thing with the community that you're talking about. But until we realize that we have to address the barriers, people will tell me, Shani, the reason why I'm not doing it because it's been too far. Shani, I don't think. All sorts of different things. And then now we have to understand that because often we don't like to hear the hard answers. We don't like to hear the answers that, we, that are not necessarily um, rated G, right? But sometimes we have to, we have to sit and actively listen because that is the only way that we'll be able to devise these strategies to help us to move forward. So that's just what I wanted to add. Thank you, Sean. Um, there do not appear to be any more questions in the chat. So I think at this time, it may be appropriate to shift our focus to the next item on the agenda, which is the interactive section of the workshop entitled Words into Action. Uh, during this time, participants will be separated into two breakout rooms. And in these groups, you will have the chance to discuss the opportunities and the challenges of integrating a circular economy into Trinidad and Tobago by identifying the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats related to the objective through your legislative perspective. Um, of course, what we are talking about is a SWOT analysis. Um, so we encourage both parliamentarians and parliamentary staff to participate. Each group will be facilitated by two representatives of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, one representative per room, who will be asking a set of prompting questions to help stimulate the discussion relating to these four categories. And at the end, participants will have the chance to come up with two possible parliamentary actions. To help you with the discussion, a fact sheet on circular economy at the national level will be provided to you. The link of this document will be shared in the chat. Panelists will also be joining the group to help provide some technical guidance as well. After the breakout group exercise, participants will reconvene in the main room and the representatives of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago that led each breakout room will provide a brief summary of their key takeaways. So at this time, Paul America staff will be randomly assigning you to a group. So please click accept when you're prompted to go to your respective breakout group. Carry on. Thank you very much, Senator Vieira. So at this point in time, I'll take the opportunity to convey the thoughts and a real summary of the discussions that we had in the first breakout room. So in terms of the strengths that we discussed, um, actually we had Madam Speaker highlighting the unique access and opportunity that parliamentarians have through their constituents. Because they essentially as MPs, they have access to their constituencies. They are more aware of the needs of their constituencies and therefore in achieving a circular economy, they are able to identify the gaps and the resources that are necessary to mobilize their constituencies when necessary. Also, um, Minister Singh had stated 
that parliamentarians have the opportunity to bring, you know, motions and the adjournments, questions to the floor to really get conversations buzzing and going on the circular economy and to get some of the answers that may not be readily available to the public and even to members at times. We also had some, I mean, not to just go on a name calling list, but we also had some great comments about parliamentarians really encouraging their colleagues and ministries to develop policies that are really in line towards achieving a circular economy and to ensure that that is incorporated in their policy um, arrangements or drafting process. And as we move on to um, weaknesses, we actually had Senator Vieira discussing an environmental commission and perhaps revising it to be an environmental court just to more or less strengthen and remove some of the um, misconceptions that may that persons may have of the role of that commission and to also really encourage that commission to undertake their responsibilities um, outside of a very bureaucratic manner. And he also spoke to a multidisciplinary task force to specifically deal with or treat with environmental matters. Also, what was highlighted, which is something that we may not always give consideration to, but is actually looking at pesticides use and to ensure that, you know, just some of the daily things that we do, even when they spray in our communities, to ensure that these things are done with an environmentally conscious mind when executing. Um, also, we had um, Senator Singh given reference to the blue economy, green economy, and how these phrases actually are not quite accepted in certain spaces. And he kind of spoke to some of the limitations that maybe the institutions that don't recognize these phrases as key terms to describe um, several sectors, maybe it's because they, um, it's a culture shift or a culture difference, but he himself had stated that he does not see any issue with the categorization um, under these particular terms. Now, moving right along to opportunities. So, Madam Speaker gave us all a nugget earlier and she reiterated in our breakout room where there is actually a company, I believe it's Express Clothing, that provides an opportunity for persons to rent clothing. And I know for the women amongst us, they may be a bit more excited for this opportunity. Some other sectors that were highlighted were actually um, ICTs and how they would play a role in achieving a circular economy, manufacturing, and how micro businesses could actually take advantage of this drive towards a circular economy as it pertains to reusing or or utilizing resources in a better manner. And also maybe incorporating some elements of renewable energy, um, solar energy, wind energy, and perhaps even looking at looking towards ecotourism as, an, as a potential avenue that would automatically encourage us as a nation to move or be more conscious, sorry, about environmental matters as it now is affecting some of what we would call our livelihood. And lastly, when we look at threats, I noted that um, Ms. LaRoche had stated that although there are alternative means to individuals engaging in practices to, towards environmental preservation, sometimes the lack of convenience or the lack of access actually is a deterrent. And so because, because of this, um, particular element, it may deter persons from fully, you know, taking advantage or supporting, giving support to environmental preservation and essentially a circular economy. And that is, I mean, of course, there are some elements that I just really couldn't recapture, but that was, in summary, some of the main takeaways from our breakout room. Thank you very much, Tarian, for an excellent job as facilitator. Um, if I may now introduce and welcome Mr. Johnson Greenwich, procedural clerk assistant, who was the who facilitated the second breakout group. Johnson. 
Hi, good morning, Senator Vieira. Good morning, um, members and um, members of staff. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, we had a, a very good discussion in breakout in breakout group two. Um, we actually had to rush back into the main session. We were still deep in, in discussion, but we did identify, manage to identify some um, items in the SWOT analysis. So the main strengths that were identified was um, Trinidad and Tobago's um, Trinidad and Tobago Parliament um, being strong in its oversight ability. Um, the ability by, this, by the parliament members to exercise oversight by, uh, on the floor of parliament to questions, matters on the adjournment, um, et cetera. And, and through questions put to entities, um, inquiry, the inquiry process in oversight committees and utilizing the ability of those committees, members, sorry, through committees and on the floor, utilizing that to forward circularity and the circular economy model, right? So that was one main strength. Another one was the, was part of the parliament channel. So the parliament has its TV channel, um, its cable channel, channel 11, and social media um, presence on Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook, etc. Um, the use of these as tools um, to promote Parliament's initiatives and that then translating, so when we talk about opportunities later on, that then translating into um, a, a strong opportunity to promote the circular economy, right? Um, we looked at also on the strengths um, how Parliament the Trinidad Tobago Parliament can advocate for the circular economy and through education initiatives, dispersing, um, using its platforms, etc., to disperse information in the communities, right? So MPs have their constituents. We, um, the constituents, C offices are connected to um, the main parliament and therefore use the parliament channel, etc., so, as I mentioned, to, um, uh, as, a part, as a type of outreach. That is an opportunity, right? And that there is an opportunity in legislation and oversight that can, sorry, there's an opportunity in the administrative functions of parliament, through the administrative functions of parliament, in particular, um, Madam President would have brought back up the parliament's initiatives um, regarding recycling, um, encouraging reusable, um, bottles instead of the use of plastic bottles, removing them totally from the chamber um, and in and around the, the, the office space and encouraging the placement of coolers around the parliamentary complex um, uh, to um, encourage that less, less use of plastic, um, etc. Weaknesses, um, the main weakness that was identified um, was the executive influence on the public um, po policy process. So while the parliament has the, the, the strong oversight ability, um, decision-making really lies with the, the cabinet, with the executive. And therefore, the parliament is kind of constrained to wait on the, the cabinet's decisions with regard to that those, any initiatives, in particular environmental initiatives, um, in this regard. So there's that. Um, Minister West um, would have raised a, a nice um, analogy um, with regard to the carrot and stick approach, <laughs> right, that we kind of, we use. So there's that, this carrot approach where um, we give incentives, incentives. Um, maybe there is an opportunity to look into the other approach where, uh, to, to compel um, action rather than than, than talk. And um, Senator C. Passard would have raised another weakness, um, the lack of an overarching policy um, direction um, with regard to recycling in, and, and then looking now at this, this new concept of circular economy. So that lack of, of, of that overarching policy directive is a weakness. 
um, from my own notes, from my own notes, I remember Senator Dylan Remy also um, raising an issue with regard to lack of, of, of the need for, rather than the lack of, but the need for members to make themselves aware of what exists, the legislation that exists, and that all members may not be aware of what um in what what legislation and policy initiatives exist with regard to the environment um and utilizing the the research capacity of the parliament to access that 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 necessary information so those are the main weaknesses there are more but those are some of the main weaknesses um opportunities um members would have emphasize um changing the 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 culture of Trinidad and Tobago through um education so educating the public through traditional and social media to inspire behavioral change right so I remember one of our legal officers Roger Hector raising that point um opportunities again I would have mentioned it the committees having the reach and the the, the power um bestowed upon them by the standing orders so the powers to the power to call for papers persons etc as an opportunity to reach out to the various stakeholders um who may be a part of this circular economy this concept of circularity and members utilizing the inquiry process to um, avail themselves of knowledge through those um stakeholders so that 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 is an uh, uh, a, a good opportunity um youth parliament um encouraging the, the behavioral change through that that method so we've seen various youth parliamentary debates and that being that um that being used as a as a as a vehicle for circularity um another opportunity mentioned by our acting clerk of the senate was the parliament's um various relationships with with external groups, um, <laughs> Pal Americas to begin with, um, these types of these types of workshops being useful, being useful to members um, as training opportunities on these on on relatively new concepts. Um, the memorandum of understanding with the University of the West Indies, so that expert knowledge being available in various um, disciplines um, being available to members and um agreements with interparties and that 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 support that can be accessed so that's a, a great opportunity for the Trinidad and Tobago parliament um the just to go right along to the actions that were identified um and this is where we had to rush this is where we had to rush out of the, the breakout room um the pal to reiterate the parliament channel and social media being used um, to disseminate um, the initiatives towards uh, regarding the circular economy and utilizing the oversight um, committees and the mechanisms used on the floor to, um, to highlight um, the gaps um, that need to be addressed with regard to circularity and to encourage um, public awareness of, 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 of the issues. So we, as I said, we had a very lively discussion and I hope I captured everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johnson. It sounds like you had a highly engaged and interactive session. So good job there. Very much so, thank you. So integrative design thinking, whether as relates to data acquisition and data-driven policies, as relates to rethinking and redesigning our systems, products, and services, or having the right policies, infrastructure, and technology in place to enable necessary changes to our lifestyles and behaviors. That's the only way to improve the planet's health and well being. I'd like to thank everyone once again for their participation. It's now clear that the exercises have led to some fruitful discussion. I would now like to hand over the floor back to our MC, Ms. Kiba Jacob Motley. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Vera, and thank you very much for moderating the session and taking care of us over the last two or so hours. Um, so I will now like to introduce the Director General of Pal Americas, Ms. Mrs. Alicia Todd, to present a short evaluation for you. Alicia. Oh, good morning, and thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all, and I am so, so grateful uh, for the uh, Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago inviting Parla Americas to help coordinate and put together this workshop. I've thoroughly enjoyed this morning's session. Thank you to all of the presenters, uh, David, Vanessa, uh, Dr. Bellet, um, Sean. It was, it's, it's such uh, thank you for the time that you've put into this today uh, for us, and uh and Madam Speaker for inviting us, uh, as always, uh, Senator Vieira for all of your leadership. And I thoroughly enjoyed my Braco group, group. So I have to give a shout out to Terry Ann, although I'm sure John Atheson did well on his side, but boy, she was a great moderator. Uh, you're higher, Terry Ann. I'll invite you for all of my Braco groups. Um, I'm actually just here to say that uh, we at Parla Americas, uh, we were delighted to do this, uh, undertake this programming. We've had to undertake this pro. Or, we were able to undertake this programming thanks to a project we have from Global Affairs Canada. And with that, we collect data as well. And so I would ask you to indulge me in please doing the short evaluation that's about to pop up on your screen just to let us know that you found uh, this workshop valuable. And uh, as we need to report back to our donor, it takes just a few minutes. They always give me this task to kind of get you motivated to fill in the evaluation. So I would be grateful if you could all do so for me. Um, and so I'll just give you a moment to, to, to do that. I'll just recall for everyone, there's two questions, so please do, or uh, four, five, oh, I'm scrolling five, but they're easy questions, so please scroll down in that evaluation if you can and answer those questions for us. But I know we went over time and you're all very busy, so as people are answering the questions, uh, ma Madam MC, I will pass it back to you. I think we can move along in the program. People can answer the questions and um, I think they'll be finishing up here very shortly, I see. I see we've had good response rate thus far. So I pass it back to you. And again, so grateful though to be here and I learned so much. So thank you for giving us this opportunity from Parla Americas. Thank you very much, Alicia. And we always enjoy, we, usually, we would prefer to have you here in person with us, but hopefully soon. <laughs> so thank you, Alicia. So now I will introduce um, uh, the Honorable Christine Kangaloo, the President of the Senate, to deliver closing remarks uh, for this workshop. Madam President, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The Honorable Bridget Anissa George MP, Speaker of the House, Cabinet Ministers and Ministers of State, other members of Parliament, members of staff at the Office of the Parliament, members of staff at the Parl Americas International Secretariat, our experts, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to move this vote of thanks and to extend to all those who contributed to today's program and its success, the collective gratitude of all of us who have participated and been enlightened by the day's proceedings. We were exposed today to contributions from gifted experts in this exciting field of circular economies. And our gratitude goes out to each and every one of them for the clarity and the passion with which they spoke and with which they penetrated what might otherwise have remained to many of us an inscrutable area. Thanks to each and all of them, we are now possessed of a far more enlightened appreciation 
of what a circular economy entails. We understand far better than we did before today's proceedings commenced that in a circular economy, markets give incentives to reusing products rather than scrapping them and then extracting new resources to create more of them. We understand all the more clearly now how in such an economy, all forms of waste, such as clothes, scrap metal and obsolete electronics can be returned to the economy or used more efficiently. And so we thank you, our distinguished panel of experts today, Ms. Vanessa Esslinger, Mr. David Oswald, Dr. Sherwin Millett, and Ms. Shan Cuffey-Young, who improved a hundredfold our understanding of these principles. What we are most grateful for, I am sure, is the fact that through these experts, the generous donation of their time and energy to Today's workshop presented us with a twofold opportunity. First, to listen to the learning from the experts on the subject and to hear firsthand about their experiences. And then second, to collectively discuss with them and amongst ourselves, how together as parliamentarians, we can integrate circular economic models in Trinidad and Tobago. Special thanks also go out to Senator Vera for his skillful moderating of the proceedings. Senator Vera's dynamic presence was felt in two ways today. He demonstrated an enviable grasp of the subject matter and he kept the proceedings moving along extremely smoothly. He also said something today that stayed with me and I'm sure with all of us when he said, waste is only waste if you waste it. It would be remiss of me to not also convey our deep and abiding appreciation to the Office of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago and to Parliamericas for co-organizing this important workshop. May I tip this audience's collective hat to you both for a job brilliantly done in organizing and executing today's event. As someone who has tried to sit on the organizer's side of many a table, I can only sit now in quiet admiration and complete wonder at how efficiently and effectively today's event was put together. To the Speaker of the House, the Honorable Bridget Anisa George MP, your dedication to continuous learning and training of parliamentarians is indisputably established and is gratefully acknowledged. As always, your support of and participation in today's workshop are keenly appreciated. I once again thank everyone present for participating. This was not an easy topic, yet you all stayed the course. And now that we have come to the end of today's proceedings, we can with grateful hearts see how much we have learned from all of it. As I go, may I remind everyone to consult the Pal America's resource environment and sustainability, mapping the strategies and plans in the Americas and the Caribbean, the link to which has been shared in the Zoom chat. And once again, I say thank you to everyone. Thank you very much, Madam President. Okay, so everyone, thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's workshop. So thank you for being here. Uh, I would um, end by saying go forth and circulate <laughs> <laughs> in the preservation of value in the form of energy, labor, and materials. So, um, so thank you very, very much to all of you for being here with us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you and goodbye.